Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. It's 6 06. Let's get the meeting started. First, welcome our guests. And let me see, I'm trying to see the list of participants. We do have some guests. Yeah. So I'm going to open it to public comments. If you could raise your hand, please, if you have a comment. Okay. I see one, two, three hands up. Okay, let's start. Erin, go ahead. Good evening. I just have a brief, can you hear me okay? Yes. I just have a brief prepared statement and I will be sharing with the board um, a more complete statement um, after I've delivered this and make sure that I get it all out properly here. Um, so my name is Erin Mooney and I'm an English teacher at U32. I'm representing the Washington Central Educators Union as liaison to the Vermont NEA Healthcare Council. As you're likely aware, state, statewide healthcare bargaining is heading to binding arbitration in early November following the failure of the parties to reach a settlement during post fact finding mediation in September. The fact finder, John Cochran, issued his report in September, and the link to that report will be in the letter that I'll share with you later. I strongly encourage you to read that document in its entirety. On almost every issue, the fact finder's recommendations are closer to the union position, and in some cases, they adopt the union position outright. Further, the fact finder asserted that the Vermont School Board Association's proposals, particularly on out-of-pocket costs and eligibility, are financially unnecessary and likely to hurt the most vulnerable and lowest paid employees in our school district. We strongly encourage you to raise any concerns you have with the Vermont School Board Association's negotiating team and board of directors. The decisions they make in the next several weeks may have significant and lasting implications for our school district and the employees who make it run. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. Tyler? Uh, hello, um, my name is Tyler Smith. I also have a short prepared statement that I wrote and would like to read to you all. Uh, I'm a math interventionist and instructional coach at Berlin Elementary, as well as the co-president of the Washington Central Educators Union. Tonight, however, I speak to you as a parent of a fourth grader at Berlin. I've come here to talk about equity. Last spring, a concern of equity was a hot topic as allied arts positions were discussed. I ask you, where is your concern for equity now? In Berlin and Callis, we still do not have licensed music teachers. In Berlin, we have a wonderful artist who's been subbing, but she's not a licensed music teacher. In Callis, the solution for the last two weeks is to have a PE teacher teach dance for exposure to music. Where is your concern for equity now? As a result of the solution of Callis music, for the foreseeable future, Berlin and Romney students do not have health education with no current solution to provide those students with the amount of health instruction they were supposed to receive this year. Where is your concern for equity now? My biggest issue as a parent is that my child along with many other children, are not receiving instruction that children at our other district schools are receiving. I feel that this board made a position that is undesirable. Undesirable to the point that our former music teacher left the district. Undesirable to the point where we haven't filled the position after it has been posted since the end of last school year. Seeing as more than half the school board was behind the allied arts change on the basis of equity in our schools, I'm puzzled as to why this is not an important subject today. Where is your concern for equity now? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you for your input both. We, we hear you and, and, and we're working hard and it's keeping us up. So it, let's move on. I don't see any other hands unless I'm missing somebody. I don't see any other hands. Hey, oh, Lindy. Yes, I, I just wanted to make a statement um, of appreciation to our staff and administrators for keeping our schools open, keeping our kids in school. I know right now being an educator is um, really, really difficult. And I wanted to say publicly how much we appreciate it. I read the school newsletters from all the schools we get them. And it's very uplifting to see all the positive things that are happening in the schools and the activities that are taking place even during this time where our children aren't able to be vaccinated and we're keeping them in school uh, quite a bit. 
So I wanted to acknowledge the extra work and energy that's going into trying to have a normal uh, education for our children as best we can. And I know people are putting in lots of extra time and mental energy as well as physical energy. Thank you, Lindy. Okay, let's move on into agenda revisions. Uh, Diane had reached out to me and she would like to add a, a staff appreciation. So we're gonna add that to 3.8 right after Berlin Town Center. Is that okay with you, Diane? Okay. Any opposition from any other board members? Okay, so let's move out, let's move in <laughs> right into our board operations discussion and, and action. Uh, this is the part of the meeting that I'm the most excited about and getting us started a little late got me a little out of my, <laughs> a little nervous, but hopefully I'll keep it together. So the uh, 3.1 humanity and justice vision statement. So I just wanted to open up by uh, have a short statement if to open the conversation. And as community leaders and public officials, we're entrusted to care for all the stakeholders in our community. Uh, how good governance contributes to community culture should be at the forefront of the work that we do together. This means setting a tone of mutual respect, active engagement, and responsiveness to cultural diversity within our district. We must recognize the pain and the struggles felt within our communities and our own roles systematically or individually that may contribute to this. Effective governing means setting the direction and creating a culture for our district. Creating a positive culture by adopting the justice and humanity statement is reflective of our school and community values. So I was gonna open up this to uh, Shelly and Jen and, uh, and have Shelly get started. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Floor, and thank you everybody for being here and for supporting the work that, of the coalition. Um, we met a long time ago. I just want to remind you that um, Jen Miller Arsenault and I dreamed about a course for the district, and she made it, she manifested it, and it was called the Racial Equity Intersectional Justice and Confronting Bias class that met last spring. And from that course, we decided to meet the board's request for an equity council with a legacy project. And we realized that equity council didn't quite match our dreams and the possibilities of the work that we could do. So several members of the class co-wrote a statement for the Humanity and Justice Coalition. And Ellen Cook is gonna read that. And then Jen um, Ingersoll is going to uh, give you some more details. So, so thank you. And I give this a listen. It's a, it's a straight statement that gives me great joy and many challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, and good evening, everyone. Humanity and Justice Coalition Vision Statement. The Washington Central Unified Union District is dedicated to taking concrete actions that provide a safer and more supportive learning environment that is free of barriers. One that affirms the identity of each of us and acknowledges and celebrates differences to create a sense of belonging for each person connected to our schools. The district, the school district is committed to creating inclusive educational opportunities that are relevant both historically and culturally, addressing the impacts of bias, prejudice, discrimination, while building more opportunity for us to thrive rather than merely survive. This statement represents a commitment within our school district to acknowledge and end oppression and oppressive systems, to center our full humanity of all in our community and to keep broadening our perspectives. These identities, including and not limited to race, color, religion, creed, national origin, ethnicity, marital status, family composition, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, 
varying physical and mental abilities and socioeconomic status, carry socially constructed meaning and value. Our commitment is to the development of cultural humility and personal growth that is best supported in a climate that respects differences and provides a sense of belonging and inclusion. Jen. Alan, Alan thank you for that. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Jen Ingersoll. I'm part of this um, exciting group who's doing such good work and I am pleased to invite you board members um, and Anna, you are included among them to certainly participate. I would like to invite you to take a look at that vision statement uh, that's been developed. It is in the packet for those um, who are not, not sure where to find it. Um, I believe it's, Jen, uh, what page is it on? It's on page three of the packet. Okay, so on page three of the packet, what I'd like to do is invite everyone to board members to read the statement to yourselves. And as you're reading, I would like to invite you to participate in a friends protocol inspired activity that will invite you to choose a word, a phrase, or a sentence from the statement that moves you or sparks your curiosity um, or you know, causes you to um, stop and consider. And what I'd like you to do is be willing to um, share that. I'm gonna give us a minute to seek one of those words or you know, a word, a phrase, or a sentence. And what I'll do is I'll call on each board member. Um, I'll probably Probably, I'll, if somebody's willing to, you know, volunteer first, I'll start with that person and then um, put another person on deck. And if, if it comes to you and you're just not, you know, you're still contemplating, you're ready to share, please feel, feel welcome to, to pass for the moment and we can come back to you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and we'll, we'll spend one minute giving that a look and I'll bring us back together in a, in a minute. Okay. And Jen, before you yeah. start, I just want to let you know, Maya Elliott is also a student member of our board now, and she's here as well. Thank you so much for that, Jen. Maya, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you're with us and invite you to be part of this process. Okay. Um, it's, and also, I want to just share that you, you may choose to say something if you'd like, or just simply the words. And that is absolutely okay, whatever that would be. Um, is someone willing to go first? Yeah, Jen, I'll volunteer sure. since I'll I was, was yeah, since I was able to chat with you guys ahead of time. First, I wanna say, I wanna welcome Ellen. Sorry, my rush, I forgot to welcome you as part two, Ellen, and I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I, the, what connects with me is is the last sentence of the statement. And if I have to pick a phrase would be cultural humility and personal growth that is best supported in a climate that respects differences and provides a sense of belonging. And I, it, it, it's, it's personal for me and also it's a journey. And, and yeah, just like in every meeting, we need to be incl inclusive, honest and intentional. And that's what it reminds me eh, of. So it's like being in community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Floor. 
I'm going to just ask if um, Chris McVeigh, would you be willing to go next and then Scott Thompson on deck? And I can't hear. Chris, Chris are you're you muted. Sorry, I was muted, but I'm happy to go next. Um, Thank you. I also focused on the, the clause that the floor hit, um, but other two other sections that speak to me is taking concrete action uh, and um, belong for each person connected to our school, because it's a very broad range and concrete action is something that should be measurable for us. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Scott, and then Maggie Weiss. Thanks. I, I actually quite like the name of the coalition, um, Humanity and Justice. The number one Confucian virtue, together with the number one Platonic virtue, um, what's not to love with that? But in the text itself, um, what sort of uh, caught my eye right at the very beginning is the reference to providing a safer and more supportive learning environment that is free of barriers. I, I know that um, certainly a safer learning environment <clears throat> And, and barriers to learning have not really been on my radar um, as, as a board member. And there's um, clearly that's, that's coming from the experience of this community of practice that has drafted the statement. So um, I'm very interested in learning more about that. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Maggie and then um, Jonathan. Maggie, I think you're still muted. Okay, am I audible now? Cell phone Zoom, different than laptop Zoom, different than iPad Zoom. Sorry. <clears throat> so um, I was especially struck by um, an an environment that is free of barriers, which I think is a phenomenal goal, um, but with just incredible challenges. Um, so that I think that's very bold language of anything in here to have um, selected. And um, I think um, that the to keep broadening our perspectives is kind of at the crux of what the school board is here to support you as educators and administrators in ensuring that our, our kids are experiencing that they are critical thinkers and um, embracing a, an, an interest in learning. Thank you, Maggie. Jonathan and then Diane. I, I think this statement encapsulates um, what it looks like to create a more perfect union within the educational environment. I think it's really uh, well done. I think it uh, is certainly a goal that we, we will all strive for. And, uh, and, I, and I think in a, in a very broad way, that's, that's exactly what it does is it captures what, you know, a more perfect school, a more perfect, educational experience for all kids and all students and faculty and staff and everyone. That's what that looks like. And, I, and, and the coalition that put this together and the folks that, involved, that were involved in this did a really, really great job doing that. Thank you, Jonathan. Diane and then Anna. Yeah, echoing what several have also said is that dedicated to taking concrete actions that provide a safer and more supportive learning environment that is free of barriers. Um, 
that's the, the critical piece that we can always say the words, but the concrete actions are what are so necessary. So I, that really stood out. Thank you, Diane. Anna and then Kari. Let me get to it there. Um, it says, I believe in just the main statement or below talking about having more perspectives added on. Um, it says, uh, let's see, to keep broadening our perspectives. I think that really stands um, strong because in order to have change be made, you need to have more than just that one view and create more diversity within to have a, a better world. Thank you, Anna. Kari, and then Maya. Yeah, hi, everyone. I was also attracted to the uh, phrase free of barriers, um, both because it um, speaks to the principle of equity, but also it implies a call to action, and that uh, action is is pretty challenging. It's, it's first we have to understand what those barriers are, then we have to identify solutions, then we have to implement them, then we have to measure the results and learn from that and adjust. And we have to do all that in conditions that are very complex and extremely dynamic. So you know, it it just for me as I think about it is just so daunting. But I get the sense that the people here want to take this on and um, aspire to what's what's in here. Thank you, Kari. Maya and then Jonas. Um, I chose the words commitment and concrete action because you can talk all you want, but like the way things change or if you actually take action upon what you say and commit to it as well. Thank you, Maya. Jonas and Lindy. Jonas, I'm not sure if I, Hi, oh, there I'm, you I'm go. Demure, as I am in line to, with my 10 year old son to get COVID tests, but okay. I'm here. I approve of the statement, um, fully supporting of it. Thank you. Okay, thanks Jonas. Um, Lindy, and I have to say, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing um, your name right, but McAllen. All right, the sentence I was focused on was, um, oops, my cursor just moved, to center our full humanity of all in our community. And I thought adding the community and the word humanity, which I think we need so much more of in our society right now. Thank you, Lindy. Helen? Um, so I love this. Thank you. Um, my The part that stood out to me um, was affirms the identity of each of us and um, creates a sense of belonging for each person, because I think that's so important. I mean, that's what we all want is a sense of belonging and community. Thank you. Thank you. Ursula and then Jill. Hi, the um, phrase that I picked was building more opportunity for us to thrive rather than merely survive because it's something more than just the minimum. Thank you, Ursula. Jill? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, I was also struck by the phrase concrete action. I think that um, it's, it's easy to, um, to, to say what we believe. It's much harder to um, take action to make it so. Thank you for that, Jill. I believe that's the, uh, that's everybody. If, I hope I haven't missed anyone. And uh, I just want to thank you very much for participating um, and, you know, for the work that you're doing. I'm going to pass this back to Floor. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Shelley. And thank you, Ellen, for coming and joining us today. And now I'll be looking at the board to, uh, to make a motion. To, and then we can discuss to accept the statement. Any volunteers? I'll move, I'll move it. Jonathan. Okay, Jonathan, 
do you want to state your own motion, Jonathan? I didn't have something crafted specifically because I thought through this activity we would something, but you can just uh, move it to ex to accept the statement yeah, I, of humanity and it. justice. Okay. Yeah, I, I move that we accept the Humanity and Justice Coalition. Uh, I, I guess we'll call it a mission or coalition vision statement. Thank you. I'll okay. second it. Thank you, Lindy. Lindy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Lindy. Okay, any discussion? Scott? Uh, I, I think it works great as a vision statement for the coalition. Um, I'm not sure it is really ready for the board to, um, to adopt in its present state. Um, if you look at it, it says, it basically declares that the district is dedicated to taking concrete actions Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, last time, the idea was that we would, um, and the board voted, to uh, send it to the policy committee to develop that very idea in more detail, to actually to come up with concrete actions, um, or at least point us in that direction. Um, the policy committee hasn't yet had a chance to to do that. Unfortunately, from um, if we say that the district is dedicated to taking concrete actions um, as a declarative sentence, um, I'm not entirely sure that it's actually true. Um, I've seen enough counterexamples, and along the lines of what uh, Kari was saying, I'm uh, aware of the of the tremendous difficulties in realizing this. But as a vision statement for a coalition that will hold our feet to the fire and that will demand um, serious things of us. I, I think that is, um, is a great use of, of this text. Let me explain myself and then I'm gonna open it up to, to Chris just to, and, 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 and Chris McVeigh and, and Lindy, you can go next, but I should have done an explanation before putting the motion maybe. So I know that this was, back in the June 23rd agenda, I had to exit that day. I gave the, um, Kari ran the meeting without all my notes, right? Because he didn't have my succession of post-its to go through it. And we didn't have uh, a chance as a board to do the, the activity and really get emerged in the work. So the, the reason to bring it back right now is because we are in the process of creating a humanity and, and justice coalition. We have a grant from the AOE that we don't want to, you know, it would be disjuncted or separate. If we, this is just a vision statement. We, if you read the uh, the second part, the scope of the work, that's where we would be involved, right? Developing and implementing and monitoring policies. This is the umbrella that would go over the work. This is just a belief statement, a, a vision statement that I think as a board, what I've been hearing is that we aspire to collaborate and with our staff, with our students, our community, right? We're listening to what they're saying. This is what they're bringing us. It doesn't, if we're gonna write policy when we send it, this is one part of what we would use. There is some model equity policy and we're gonna write policy. We're gonna to have to include BIPOC community also. We can't write policy in isolation of this work. This is kind of the first step. That is just my, um, you know, I think this really sets an umbrella of equity as a board, as a governance creates a culture that we value this. And then we can take concrete actions. If Lindy, and then Chris, you don't have your hand up, but you and I had a conversation oh. about the policy. And I, I will go after Lindy. Okay, go ahead, Lindy. I was just speaking that my understanding of this motion is to accept this vision statement it's not to accept, because then it says what the scope of the work based on the grant. So it's not implementing a policy as much as it's putting our support behind the vision statement and then 
doing these developing, implementing, monitoring, facilitating, developing. So that's how I saw our accepting this as a vision statement, but not a policy, but our support of this work that was grant funded. Thank you, Lindy. Chris? Yes. Um, so the policy committee is taking up um, to develop an equity policy. We will be uh, considering policies from other districts uh, and the model policy that the BA has crafted. And we'll also um, be guided by the Humanity and Justice Coalition vision statement um, and incorporating views from um, other folks across our community. Um, the vision statement um, I see as a guide, uh, as an aspiration, um, but not as a specific policy that the board is now adopting. I think its elements will be incorporated into a policy after uh, that'll be presented to the board for discussion. Um, so that's that's what our, our plan is for the policy committee. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Any, any other questions or discussion from board members? Are we ready to vote? Oh, Scott. Um, I, I'm sorry, but um, on uh, it's a it's a beautiful statement from a particular um, again particular community of practice um, that is, I think, uh, drafted with uh, kind of a a background of common knowledge and shared understandings and, and language, shared vocabulary um, that has sort of uh, become so much a part of their work that it is to some extent perhaps taken for granted in the, uh, the drafting of this, which um, I, I think what happens is that for people who are not actually read in to um, to the vocabulary, to the um, the the context, that <clears throat> it may not be entirely intelligible. Um, just as an example, the uh, <clears throat> the passage on identities um, could be interpreted as you know, an endorsement of the methods of big data to tag us and make us, um, make us like legible to, um, to the companies that market to us. Um, so I, I um, this I guess is my blue pencil speaking. I, I would love for the board to have a chance to actually be part of the drafting process or the editing process of a statement that the board is, itself is going to be adopting rather than, you know, sort of receiving it, putting our stamp on it of uh, our seal of, of approval and, and letting, I think, all allows us to engage with the statement much more closely and to ask the kinds of questions that we need to ask in order to truly take it on board and make it our own. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I'm gonna call out the vote. All those in favor of adopting the motion as read by Jonathan, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Please say no. Yeah, I'll have to say no. Thank you, Scott. So the motion carries. Uh, thank you, everybody. Let's uh, move on. Thank you, Shelly, again. And thank you, Ellen. And uh, oh, yeah, Jen, <laughs> there you are. OK, uh, you're free to stay. And if you need to go, please go ahead. Uh, let's debrief the Community Engagement uh, Forum 3.2. OK. So we didn't get a lot of feedback. We got, I'm, I'm looking now at Jen Miller Arsenal. We got just a couple of, uh, uh, of replies. 
but we didn't get enough community. You know, that is a reality. We did not get enough people coming to the meeting and we need to do better on that. So if I'm just gonna open it for, for quick questions uh, from, from the board and let Jen uh, share what she heard from the two uh, feedback forms that we got. Ready for me to share and then share sure. questions? Yeah. yeah, so as as you know, we only had four community members join us. And so we had more breakout rooms than we had community members. Um, I think the conversations in those rooms were lively and substantive. That's direct feedback from the feedback form. And we really, really wished that we had had more folks um, in there. A little bit more feedback. Um, the few folks that were there want some more quantitative data um, going forward in addition to some of the qualitative data. And just again, questions about how do we foster more community involvement? So I know that um, in looking ahead to the next forum uh, focused on budget, we've been brainstorming ideas about that. We had really hoped that we'd have um, for the board you guys would hear from enough folks um, about certain themes that it would lay the groundwork for you in terms of some pri uh, priorities and parameters. Some of the things that were said again and again were again, a need for some clear measurable goals, that's sort of a foreshadowing to the next topic we'll talk about. Um, people expressing gratitude, as you heard tonight earlier for um, things like uh, allied arts, uh, sports was mentioned, technology, it was mentioned in multiple rooms um, and uh, social emotional learning and restorative practices, multi-layered systems of support and intervention. Those were some of the themes and um, a huge thanks to the administrators who took good notes and then uh, Suzanne again compiled them for us. So. Thank you, Jen. Any reflections from other board members? Questions? Okay, let's move. Let's move on. We have picked a, a topic for the next uh, community in in engagement too, and we'll talk about that. Uh, as well, I guess we could talk about that right now. I was going to leave it on the finance part. Uh, I'm looking now at Kari. Uh, what do you think? Should we leave it or do it now? I, I think what we have decided to do is to. Um, what do you think? Because we, Sorry, you guys, were part. I don't understand the question. Oh, so should we, do, should, should we do it, talk about the future community engagement now uh, too, or, or leave it as sure. part of the finance for, I'm just asking the finance committee, I guess, Todd and Chris, you can, I think it might be easier to do it now, right? Or, yeah, uh, I think it's good, good time. Yeah. Okay. So what we were hoping is that at the next community engagement, which would be November 3rd, uh, we would be sharing uh, some information from because we didn't get enough people at our last uh, community engagement, we would be synthesizing some of that information. And also, let me just grab here my, my notes. We would, uh, we would, we we're gonna try to frame the conversation around having, it, having this forum help us set our parameters for, for budgeting. And, um, it, and then we had some ideas, uh, Kari help us with some, uh, questions and we would like to share, you know, uh, our, the pandemic, uh, you know, anything that we have about COVID and the realities of that, any social and emotional factors, uh, learning and instruction uh, you know, per pupil spending. And uh, uh, like we said before, the implementation plan uh, where we are with that, but summarize it even smaller. So we don't take over the entire meeting with that. And then we would move into uh, small groups and try to categorize that and have two specific questions, what was, was suggested. So the first question would be what, it, what excites you the most uh, about, uh, and what is more meaning or what is more meaningful for you uh, in, in the dist as aspects of the district. And um, I'm just looking at my notes. So I might be missing one of the questions that you had a, a what was the other question, Kari? I'm missing. Well, I, I, had a, I had a number of ideas, but um, yeah. I think the point is to try to keep the conversation at a, a such a level that um, community members can meaningf meaningfully engage with um, 
with what's, you know, let us know what's important to them as we go into the budgeting process. So we're not going to be looking at numbers and what dollars we're going to allocate to different categories, but we do want to hear how people are thinking about what is most important to them, what they what they think we should be prioritizing and, and that sort of thing. So that when we um, uh, come back and meet next time, we're actually able to take some of that input in our own thinking and, um, and start to come up with uh, what we've called parameters or really it's guidance for the staff about what we think are the priorities with this next budget. Um, uh, so, so I think, um, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's really the idea. And, and to, to set that conversation up, we have to sort of summarize the context as we see it. So there's a lot of factors there, you know, there, there's, you know, the, the whole story of COVID, there's the current state of, of learning for our students, you know, including some of the social emotional, there's the, the financial picture there. And we have to kind of summarize that, you know, in a, in a way that um, helps you know, what, what, what we're seeing, um, but th then still allows them to have meaningful Im input. It, it's gonna be challenging, but I, I think it's something we've never really quite done. We've never asked the questions in this way at this stage. Um, and, it, and it may be that we get some good input on, on where we wanna take this next budget. And, and we, we are going to be partnering in a more meaningful way way with the Friends of, uh, Washington Central Friends of Education too, and they try to help us also bring more people to our meetings that are not necessarily have kids in the in the school, and yeah, that would be really important. Maggie, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, is there going to be an opportunity for some discussion about um, approaches to communicating with the general public, the U32 district community, about the meeting? Um, I personally think that some of the ways that the information is conveyed, in particular through Front Porch Forum, um, is not accessible and for example, like having some very um, accessible language and um, simple topics of discussion might make it more appealing to somebody to participate because it may speak to their their concerns rather than here's a link to here's the link here's the agenda. Um, I just think it's a large volume of information and and that creates a barrier to people even. Um, recognizing that it's something that they they want to show up for. That's really important, Maggie. Yeah, so we accept all your help in getting that the information out too. So yes, we, we would be brainstorming and that's part of what we want to do better. Even trying to, you know, you personally invite people to the meeting usually helps because you're able to have a conversation with them. So whether it is your a set of friends or your own personal email list it also helps but yes any... and, and so i'm asking what where what is the the method through which we can communicate that and where is that happening in advance of this next meeting when we're going to have another community forum so i i think now would be the time for that maggie and we're definitely going to have a going to try to have a small a, a subcommittee group for just the a, the um, the community engagement. Uh, Jen was going to meet with Suzanne next week. Yeah, go ahead, Jen. Yeah, I think I, what I would add is, so Suzanne and I are starting to plan the presentation right now, and we talked at the leadership team meeting the other day about um, making sure that our staff has the same overview and opportunity for input as well. Um, and I can absolutely, I, it's on my list of future topics to include in the community newsletter. I know that um, not everybody is on the infinite campus list, but we've been posting that regularly on the homepage of the district website. And I strive to write that in language that is accessible and not filled with jargon. So I welcome input about that as well. So should we be emailing you directly? Because I, I, as you know, those of us, you have board members with expertise in different areas. My particular area happens to be communication. And I'm looking through the lens of 
a 40 something year old who gets way too much email isn't likely to open those emails. And I, I think that we're missing population. Me emailing, emailing my personal email list is not gonna be effective in reaching the population of the community I represent. So I'm, I'm interested in how can I participate in making sure that we're reaching people more effectively because what I'm hearing is we got four participants. Um, so I don't think the current approaches are necessarily effective. Sure, Maggie. Why don't you email email Jen and 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 myself, okay. and we'll and we'll set up something. We any help that we can get. Okay, yeah, and please. I'm happy to send it in a bulleted email. I don't want to spend you know valuable time of the board meeting doing it, but I'm just not hearing. How, how do I do that? And I'm looking to participate. So are, are you okay with sending an email to 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 Jen and myself, and and then we'll. Spread it in and in include others too. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts from any? I'm you know, I'm not doing so well in time today, so I'm trying to move us along. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, Maggie, your hand is still up, but I'm just going to move on. Uh, board Smart um, Goals update Laura? page. Yes. Did you see that Erica had put something in the chat about Ooh. that? Yeah, I don't even know. That, uh, yeah, the chat shouldn't be open, but sorry, Erica. It is. It's working <laughs> tonight. So I just <laughs> disabled the look. chat after I saw that, FYI. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and Erica, we, you know, uh, you know that uh, we're engaged in the conversation, and you know that we're partnering with this. We've been emailing with you guys all of the support that we can get. Like I said, we would be partnering with you. So I, I think you have an avenue to get to to us. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, can we move into Smart Goals update page four? So the SMART goal that we have ahead is the one committee, uh, all of the other committees uh, met too. Uh, the finance committee met and uh, we have a proposed goal. Uh, we, we haven't finalized it. So I'm gonna start with that one so that I, we can move on. That one is a very quick overview. We're hoping to do uh, a long-term planning, a five-year long-term plan that can lead to a 25-year capital plan for our all our buildings in the in the district working in partnership with uh, Chris our uh, facilities director and Bill Ford and uh, and all of the different uh, uh, engineers and architects that we might need with that it, we will be sending that to the board uh, shortly and that was our idea of a long term plan uh, for that that particular goal uh, and then I'm going to pass it on to Jen uh, the the community engagement committee met yeah so uh stephen look ursula and michaela and i met about the community engagement goal you have that in your packet starting on page four um we left all of the our raw notes and thinking in there and that's what ultimately brought us down to the smart goal that's on the bottom of page five on your packet um so really, I, I would say in a nutshell, and then I'm going to invite Ursula McHale and, and Stephen, if he's here yet, to, um, to talk about it, but um, really wanting some, some degree of reciprocity in terms of um, being able to, um, to hear more from the public um, at times and to generate the topics um, and the participation, not unlike you were just saying, Maggie, to get folks to come and um, help the board uh, hear from the community in order to do its best work. And I would invite uh, Ursula McKaylin if you wanna elaborate on that. Um, well, I think we came up with this goal before the last community forum. So it's kind of interesting because I, I don't, I at least didn't, um, wasn't thinking only four people would show up. So, <laughs> um, but we were, we developed this as, you know, as you said, kind of how can we have that reciprocity um, with the community and um, just have more room for feedback. Um, and so I think 
you know, in, in light of what Maggie just said and our experience with the last community forum, if I could change anything, I would have some sort of, um, you know, this is only going to work if we get people to the community forum. So I don't know if, you know, there's a role for um, a community engagement committee or if that's already being filled by another new, new to the board. So maybe that's being filled already by another um, entity. But um, but this goal will only work if we get people to the forum. So, but I do think it's a great goal and I think it's measurable. It's a good smart goal. So. Ursula, do you have anything you want to add right now? Um, I think McKaylin covered a lot of it. I mean, we did have a lot of conversation on um, getting information to people. There are times that we need to provide information similar to the last community forum where we were trying to talk about the implementation plan and it was, this was our plan. This is what we've managed to get done. And right, as she said, the goal was written before that community engagement meeting. And I mean, I think I said it in an email to our small group is, you know, maybe trying to figure out a way to do um, a community engagement committee or something that can look at different things like barriers to meetings or communication. But this is a measurable goal that we have that is relevant. It's also something we're doing and the board has already committed time to. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, Kari, do you want to share a little bit? Oh, and Maggie, is that an old hand or a new hand? Do you, do you have a question for in this particular goal? Go ahead. I I just wanted to comment that I think community engagement is our collective responsibility as a board, and I think you know, in the questions that were posed to us when we were interested in those of us who are new to the board, that that was pretty clearly communicated by the current board members. Um, so it, it would concern me if that was like reduced to a small group, because I think it requires the input of all of the board members representing diverse communities, um, because, you know, we're, each community is different and how communication might occur with the general population in each community is not the same town to town. Thank you, Maggie. Yeah. Kari, do you want to summarize here? You're talking about the student achievement goals? Yes, yeah, just the status, yeah. Sure, sure. And uh, before I just have one comment on, the, on this uh, goal that we were just looking at about, about the forums. Just one little um, nuance that might make it me both measurable and help us with planning is to develop a cal calendar for the rest of the year about what these forum topics are. And then a practice of perhaps that we're always looking at the next three. So we, we know what's coming and, and we can sort of delegate um, different responsibilities for planning the next three um, sort of on a rolling basis. But anyway, um, the Ed Quality Committee met this month and um, took a look at the goals that we had uh, established for student achievement last year. And we're working on updates to those um, that we will bring you uh, next time we meet in November. And they track fairly closely to um, what we have been doing. Um, just we took a we took a break since the summer. Um, the first goal is about um, be, um, having a developing a shared understanding of our student learning outcomes and all that's involved with them at, at a pretty high level. But understanding what the what the um, each outcome is. Um, how, how we approach it in terms of instruction, um, getting some student teacher voice in there and looking at um, some of the results. Uh, we had done most of that work last year, but we have a few more outcomes to do. And then, um, and then out of that, developing an annual calendar for monitoring our, our progress and achievement of those outcomes. The other one had to do with, uh, the other goal was setting up for strategic planning. And I think that um, we weren't really able to get started with that. Um, uh, that was sort of envisioned for, for later. And at this point, we, we don't think that we're really ready to get started with um, um, strategic planning. Um, but there are things that we can do to prepare ourselves 
So that's what the committee is discussing. What could we do over the coming year that would get us ready to do um, a good job with strategic planning once we have um, um, uh, next year's superintendent in place and are really, really ready to, to dive into that. So more to come on that. We'll bring that to you in more detail in November. Thank you, Terry. Uh, let's move to 3.4. Uh, re review BSBA resolutions and appoint a voting member to the annual meeting. Uh, did everybody had a chance to look over the resolutions? Or do you wanna go one by one or are you okay with the recommendations from the committee? Okay, could I see more thumbs up? Is I see Scott or if you're okay? Okay. <coughs> So we don't need to do discussion on that. We could appoint a, a board member to participate and, and vote. In uh, We get one vote uh, in the resolutions uh, that set the tone for the next uh, the next year and adds to the rest. Uh, I chair the resolutions uh, committee as vice president. So I, it would be totally understandable if you guys want to have somebody else be the, the voting member. So if there's somebody else that wants to volunteer, please go ahead. Um, could we have a nomination? <laughs> and this will be a quick conversation. I'm looking at people. Anybody that is dying to go? <laughs> I'm happy to volunteer, but I, I'm just putting that, you know, that I do chair that. So I wanted to be clear that I, I chair the resolutions committee as vice president. So that's, you know, yeah, but um, I, I don't see this votes really going anywhere differently. So Scott? Sorry, I honor your full disclosure, Flora, but um, I'm, I, I would nominate um, pretty much just about anybody, and I'm sure that they, well, um, if I were to nom nominate you, Ursula, would that, um, would you be willing to do that? I would be willing to do this. This is the meeting on November 4th, right? To go as yes. the voting member? Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's via Zoom. It's not going to be in person anymore. We moved it. It's so it's via okay. Zoom. Yeah. In that case, I nominate Ursula. Perfect. Could I have a second? A second. Thank you, Chris. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so we can ask and Chris. Any Hello, opposed? Ursula. I hear none, the motion carries. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, superintendent evaluation. I'm gonna pass it on to Kari. Yeah, so um, we are committed to conducting a superintendent performance evaluation this year, and I offered to help out with that. And I thought it would be interesting to go and take a look at what some of our neighboring districts are doing, how they're conducting their evaluations, and some, some of that results of my uh, research are in the packet there. Um, I guess to summarize it, for me, it confirmed a couple of things. One is that the things, the systems that we've used in the past are um, for superintendent evaluation, they're not really out of the ordinary. There's, there's um, you know, th um, elements that are similar to what other districts are doing. But at the same time, I think there is room for improvement that we can learn from others. Um, each, of their, each of the other systems had elements to it that, that would make our system better. So in that spirit, um, I shared this with the uh, steering committee um, and after reviewing, um, VSBA's standard offering on um, supporting superintendent evaluation. The committee's recommending that we make a relatively small investment and uh, hire, hire a VSBA um, person to help us next year or this year. Um, and the idea is that, we, you know, with the help of an expert, um, they can help us design, you know, the best system that we can that we can use into the future. So that's it. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, would you be willing to make a motion uh, or somebody else? Sure. So and I will we can move have some that, discussion. Yeah. yeah, I will move that the board um, um, spend up to a thousand dollars on um, hiring VSBA expert to help us design a superintendent performance evaluation system. Thank you, Kari. Could I have a second? 
see Maggie trying to unmute. Oh, second. Okay, Maggie. <laughs> Just because all the effort it takes to unmute that cell phone, she gets. Uh, that's all those in favor of, oh, sorry. Discussion. Any discussion? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, ahead, so please. I have, I have um, not, it seems to me that the, the outline of the VSBA would do um, is it involves the superintendent. Uh, and if we're going to have a new superintendent, uh, then this doesn't seem like a worthwhile effort to me um, because the new superintendent would not have had the input into this process that seems to lean pretty heavily upon the superintendent's input. Um, the, second, the second question I have is the extent to which this, um, um, to which our committee have input in creating the evaluation because the um, process laid out here in terms of how the VSBA does it seems to be fairly narrow in terms of the scope of individuals that are included in the evaluation. It seems to me to be board members, uh, administrators, leadership team, um, but not much beyond that. Those um, uh, those three entities. Um, it doesn't seem to me to include a broad base of staff. Um, doesn't seem to me to include community members in terms of actually uh, re returning response uh, on any type of survey. So um, I, that that would be a big concern of mine because I think we. Would rather I'd rather spread, uh, spread a broad net for uh, involvement and response for how our superintendent is is performing. Um, it would make sense if, and I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jen Miller Arsenault. Jen Miller Arsenault was considering to continue as a, as a, as a candidate. If she's not, then this seems to me to be premature for this year might be worthwhile to consult and, and develop some type of forms, but it, it, this process seems to be superintendent heavy. Uh, so I would have concerns about that. Even though the cost I don't think is great. Harry, go ahead. Pretty reasonable course, cost. Yeah, so to Chris, that's an inter interesting first point you make about involving the superintendent and the design of the system that we're ultimately gonna use. Um, I, I think there's something to that. I, I think that you could also argue the other side that we want to develop a system that's independent of individuals. It's really about evaluating the performance of the superintendent. And um, well, yeah, we are open to what our next superintendent has to say about the process. And I think that it will evolve over time. I'm kind of attracted to the idea of developing an independent who, who, who that next person is um, because the principles remain the same. Um, and to your other point about um, BSBA and how much input we have, I, I, I should have mentioned this. I get, I get the sense that it's very customizable. They have some recommendations, but I kind of pressed them on this point about how much ultimately do we, do we decide. And I got the sense that it really is up to us in the end how we want to design our system. And I'm very sure after being through this a number of times, we're going to have the conversation about who do we ask for in direct input um, and who do we not ask? That, that's come up every time we've done these evaluation systems. I'm sure we'll have, we'll have that conversation again. Jen? Yeah, I wanted to weigh in here too. I think that um, what you as a board have this year is the opportunity to test a few things out, to try out a system um, and get some feedback and make sure that the evaluation system that you're putting in place is yielding useful data for you um, as you have an interim in the position. And I am happy to support you in that work. Um, you can ask and design what you want and I will, um, I will work in service to you to, to tweak as necessary. So um, this is a great opportunity, I think, for you all to, um, to try out things and develop a system that yields the information that you want and need going forward. Thank you, Jen. Uh, let me see, Chris McVeigh and then Maggie. You're muted, Chris. Floor, I've already had my piece. I just, I didn't unraise my hand, sorry. Maggie? Um, just raising the question of whether this 
um, expanded emphasis on community engagement might not be a, a future way for the public to participate in and other stakeholders participate actively in a superintendent evaluation by having a structured time and space for that voice to be heard. Thank you, Maggie. Yes, so so I think I, I do want to make a comment too, and I, I agree with what Kari and Jen were saying. What we what we really want to create is a system that doesn't rely on a particular person. I think we learned a lot in the past couple of years and and the you know from reading the descriptions that Kari sent in that in those documents, it, this would allow us to have a full 360 and really have input from multiple stakeholders instead of just a few. So is there any other questions or we can put this to vote? So Flora, I have a follow-up. Yeah. So that, that was my concern is that it didn't seem to provide a full 360. Um, do you, you think you read these as providing full 360? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it provides a full 360. Yeah, it provides a full 360 evaluation. Okay, taking that, thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the motion as read by Kyrie and second by Maggie, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Let's move um, on superintendent search on page uh, 13. So in the superintendent uh, search, uh, we had a, a conversation at the steering uh, committee and our recommendation was to create a small uh, group of, of board members to hire a consultant uh, and get four different consultants to come and interview with the with the small group or the entire board if they are available on the on those particular dates that that small committee can meet. Um, we think it's important to have a minimum of four consultants, and so far we have three. We're waiting for one more, uh, and uh, let's see. And we're hoping that the consultant will be ready to start working with that smaller group the third week of November. So I know I received, I, I think Jonas is now able to join us. I, uh, Stephen Luke was not able to join us tonight. He, he doesn't want to participate. He, when I, I asked him the question, I wanted to make sure that I knew who won it and who didn't. I, I know Jonas, I don't know if he's been able because I haven't been keeping track. If he is with us yeah, right now, he did want it. Okay he wanted to join the committee. So if we could, uh, you know, have four people, you know, including myself to be in the search uh, committee that are willing to put on the time or to have the, have the time. And it doesn't have to be four, it can be five. We don't wanna have a really large group because that, that group working with the consultant with the, will decide the composition of the committee uh, at large. Right. This is just the, the beginning. It's just to elect the, the consultant. And if I'm missing something, please. Uh, oh, Lindy, you have your hand up. I just had a question about the committee meeting times. Uh, I know in the last superintendent search, the committee was <clears throat> not always meeting at times that were available for me. And so before I was offering to do any part of this, I needed to know that part. Yeah, I, I think Lindy, that's a, that's a that's a good question. It, so far, we we haven't we we haven't interviewed. It's the uh, it, you know con consultants, and we we would have to work with them to see in in the past during the day to not add more stress to you know um, to the leadership team too. It, we have met during the day, but we can make it if the majority of that group can meet in the evening. I think it's hard to tell until we have a group. <laughs> So I think we should be open to what works best for, 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 for all. Scott. Thanks, Fleur. Um, I, I just suggest that if possible, we invite some of the newer board members to take part because they're the future. And um, I, I certainly hope 
and um, they'll. This is part of their, um, you know, they're building that future is being um, joining in the search for the new superintendent. Thank you, Scott. So any volunteers? I know Jonas had volunteered and we can have a mix of old and new. Diane, you have a question. Yeah, so I just wanna clarify. So is this the committee that's just interviewing the consultants or is this the committee that's interviewing the consultants and then we'll shift into the superintendent search or which part of this is it? Yeah, so the the board members. So I, I I guess we can we can decide that. But I was envisioning, you know, no more than four people if possible, because then those four people could transition into the uh, into the committee, and we wouldn't have to redo it. But right now, that those four people would just be interviewing uh, consultants. They won't be the hiring committee. So I'm open to it if the meetings work. Also, if I don't want to hold up the schedule. And also, if there are others who would rather be on it, I'm more than happy to step aside for that too. But if you need to fill out the numbers, I'm happy to do that. Okay. So, so far we have Jonas. Uh, any of the new board members? One of you guys that are willing to put in the time? Ursula? Okay. I volunteer if neither Maggie or Michaela wants to. I don't want to take all of the. I'm waiting to hear. Go for it. I, uh, <laughs> Sorry, my wonderment. I, yes, Maggie. My wonderment about the the consultant search is really just I think some general questions about how that process is continuing because we talked about it in a previous board meeting and just not knowing I how many people do you need to do this if you know if there are three out of four already selected to interview um yeah. so, I have thoughts and I have concerns um in terms of the search but I, I I haven't gotten answers to kind of where you guys are at to know you know, how, whether I would want to participate or not. Maybe those concerns have been met. I, I guess I'm not understanding the question, Maggie. So we, so far we have, we, th there's a limited amount of consultants out there and with the time frame, but we can, you know, we can change that if, if, if needed. Right now where we had requested was four different consultants that would give us broad options if, so, that the, so that the committee has options it, so, and we said a minimum of four should give us enough mm -hmm. uh, options to get the most important thing for, you know, at, at least from my point of view as, as chair and leading the search is that we get on a timeline and we get this done, right? Yeah. Like we, we, we don't have time to lose, right? So, and we want to create that committee, uh, you know, between November and December post. And we're hoping to, you know, do interviews in January and February, which is the best time. To be interviewing, so that is sort of our our our, our time frame. So the you know people that we would be in, interviewing have uh, have a reputation in the state, right? That that would be uh, right. So that begs one of the questions: is why are we limiting ourselves to just our state? Um, you know, and I think this was discussed in a prior board meeting um, in reflection of how these searches have gone previously in hiring. And, and that's just as a community member, you know, aware of that, not having participated or, or attended board meetings during that time. So I, I'm interested in participating in the, the search, I guess is okay. what it comes down to. Yeah, and the consultants are just to help frame the process. The consultants are not the potential candidates. And so exactly. we don't know yet if we're limited to just the state. It's just this is the um, kind of the guide to help that committee move forward with exploring what options are out there. Yeah, I completely understand that. I'm just wondering if, you know, we're limiting ourselves if we're working with the same narrow group of consultants that have been interviewed or utilized previously. And I'm, and I'm not 100% clear on that. If these, 
this is the same group of people and if expanding outside of just Vermont might um, give us some additional perspective that might be helpful in meeting the district's goals um, in terms of a superintendent search. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it is. My and we're, I, we're, I, we have a small population and I understand that there's expertise that comes from being in the Vermont community already, but I think that we have particular demographic um, makeup in our community and, and um, even on the state level that is mirrored in other places in the country where you know there might be um, some some new and fresh perspective on superintendent search that might be beneficial instead of doing the same thing. But a point well taken, uh, Maggie. I think uh, one of the things that we were thinking was that we, we need uh, somebody that we're going to cast a broad net, like Diane said, for getting candidates and you know and trying to diversify and really put out the word far, far. But if you're going to, and, and then for the consultant, it is also important to understand the culture of, of our, you know, to, to really understand our communities uh, understand and be able to identify and ask the right questions, right? Because it would, we are not going to do this process in isolation of our, 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 our staff, our leadership team and our communities. So that was the thinking in having the consultant be somebody in Vermont, but having a really broad net. But if you're going to participate in the in the in the in the hiring process, we you know we can use your expertise. So right now, I, I think it, we we have the four people: so Jonas, Ursula, and and Maggie. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah, well, and, and myself, John, I will be leading the search. It's so, or because I don't think we need five board members, you know, even if I stay out and just lead the search, that would be yeah, enough. It's, so, could I have a motion by one of the board members? Scott? Uh, before I make the motion, I just wanted to make sure. Um, uh, I thought that McKaylin was about to say something. No, I'm happy to not be the one. My mom just had knee surgery and I'm helping care for her and her little puppy. So I was, I'm, I was giving my blessing. Thank you though. <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, I'll move that the, um, so, bless you, that the, uh, bless you, um, that the superintendent uh, search committee be formed of Flor Diaz Smith, Jonas Uno Van Fleet, um, Maggie Weiss, and Ursula Stanley. And I would just offer a friendly amendment, Scott. It's not the search committee, it uh, is the consultant. The hiring the consultant. Right. right. Thank and you, I'll Chris. Second that. I'll second that. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. Move, uh, Berlin Town Center. Uh, I think uh, looking at our, our time frame, that is not an urgent issue right now. I'm gonna table the Berlin Town Center uh, for now and move into staff appreciation. And then I'm gonna have us take like a two minute break people that need to go to the bathroom anything we've been meeting for over an hour almost an hour and a half but let's go ahead and uh, Diane I, oh for, sorry I'm sorry Diane but um was there supposed to be materials on the Berlin Town Center or was it just going to be an update it, it was just going to be an update and you know it's okay. fairly quick I, I can also do okay. an update but no problem update. thank you yeah yeah okay, okay. Diane Sure, and I don't know, Floor, if it would be possible to show the document at all that I had sent you. Um, sure. So, so Chris um, and Lindy and I were uh, met on September 30th. McKaylin had been hoping to join us, but then wasn't able to. And so we were brainstorming ways that we could um, show staff appreciation throughout the year. And so we came up with some suggestions that feedback from the board would be helpful around. 
And one thing as, as Floor is pulling up the document, one thing was what Lindy modeled for us. So the um, ability that we should, uh, you know, use the opportunity of, of expressing appreciation or things that we've noticed um, in our board at a board meeting just to kind of spark all of our um, engagement in it as well as acknowledgement of appreciation. Um, the other one was uh, being present at, uh, you know, a quarterly staff meeting just for about five minutes, just so that uh, staff know who we who we are on a rotating basis. Um, and again, not intending to stay long because we don't want to impact or, or create this feeling of us um, eavesdropping or, you know, but but ways that we can be present. Um, the other was that if, it, you know, all of these are impacted by COVID, obviously, but, you know, the newsletters keeping abreast of the different activities that are going on within the community. And I, I do want to say that all of this means, doesn't mean I stick only to Berlin. It doesn't mean people's, it's about really taking part in a, across our district as to joining into activity. So if we notice in the newsletter that there's a community activity at Rumney and I wanna join it, that I would reach out to the school and say, you know, I, I would love to come and be part of this so that we would set up an opportunity um, <clears throat> for activities for, for board members to sign up for that. Um, another idea uh, was to help organize some wellness activities. So thanks to reach out. Things, you know, so I had offered to reach out. There's a, a wellness committee that generally is part of each school. So is there a way we can help to create these things? Another thought I was having around that is even if we created potentially some virtual opportunities so that say there's a yoga um, a class that could be offered, it could go out to all the schools at once if it's done virtually, as well as there might be um, a different type of uh, something to help relieve stress for people. So if we could help to organize that, keeping in mind, thinking of all of these things as to be um, free to very cheap at this point, knowing that at the end of the year is when we look toward the other work. Um, another idea was uh, providing a healthy snack. So like a fruit basket or different opportunity, uh, different things like that quarterly um, within the, uh, you know, so again, having a sign up list for that. The other thing that I realized was missing was Chris had stressed that what we want to do is to really potentially alleviate um, something that they're already doing. Is there a way for us to step in and help in some way um, to, in, to help with that? So these were recommendations. Um, I don't know, Chris and Lindy, if you wanted to say anything about it, but feedback from the board would be helpful as to do we continue to pilot some of these things or what are people's preference? I don't think I have anything to add as far as we, I think our purpose, kind of like having more community involvement is more recognition of our school staff and administrators publicly um, in a way that's genuine and not, oh, this is part of the agenda each week um, because we do a lot of business, but we don't always take the time to recognize what a great job the district is doing in um, just recognizing people. Uh, and I think Diane uh, did not summarizing um, our discussion and um, our hope for uh, board feedback on these various proposals. Um, but one of our overall overarching uh, goals was to not add of something else to do, but kind of detract and, and uh, make it easy for staff to either have a board member come in or something like that. But just it was not to add on to their plates that are already overflowing. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. And if there's no any other board questions, this is great work and you'll continue. Oops, Scott. I'm sorry, Flora, you were on a roll. It was great. <laughs> I, I apologize for interrupting. 
Um, I hope you can pick up the thread once, I, once I'm done. Uh, I just wanted to add in um, that, uh, especially with U32, but not just with U32, um, we, uh, we have faculty, I think, who are um, in many cases exceptionally able and, with, uh, and ambitious to do different things. Um, and I've, I've always thought that it would be um, uh, a way to appreciate the faculty, but yes. also to allow them scope for, for professional and personal growth, to have built into the career track, you no, know, just like college faculty, um, opportunities for, for sabbaticals, for uh, certain kinds of you know, um, uh, academic or research or, um, or uh, travel or, or other, okay. not, not that we would pay for, but that we would at least allow the possibility for. Um, and I, I don't know if that would fit in the, in the scheme that you're putting together, Diane, but um, I think uh, it might help us to retain um, some of the, you know, um, well, the wonderful people that we have and give them a sense that they're not, you know, imprisoned in, a, in an elementary school or a high school for their whole career, but that they're, you know, that it actually is a, is a vehicle for, um, you know, for their own uh, intellectual and, and personal development. I think that um, that's great thinking, Scott. It, I, it's beyond the scope of this work, I think, because it really creates this bigger part. What it, what, it invit, what it created for me in terms of a thought is around even that ed quality work that's happening and as to how do we make sure that um, we're supporting the, the instruction and the work that's happening. Because what I hear you saying is, is there that room for growth? Is there that room to step away and explore something else which will enrich what they're doing as um, in their work? Um, and so that, that's a great idea. I don't know that it would fit in this, this grid, but I think we need to keep that idea and not lose it. Thank you, Diane. Jen? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, really, on behalf of the staff, thank you for engaging in this conversation and thinking about the ideas. Folks are working so hard, as you know, and there's a baseline stress and level of exhaustion that people have, and it is only the 20th of October. So I just want to say your acknowledgement of that and really um, intentionality in acknowledging and appreciating the staff is um, is also appreciated, so thanks. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up to student. I, I know that I promised a break, but I think I was looking at my notes and my break was past 4.23. So I think we're gonna keep going and let our students who have been <laughs> sitting with us very patiently uh, do the report. Hi, Anna and Maya. And Steven. Let me just pull up my notes real quick. Uh, let's see. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope you are having a great night and enjoying the meeting thus far. Um, let's see. So you third, can you all hear me just to be sure? Okay. So um, this week at U32, it is Spirit Week. And that is, um, we have an, our pep squad, which is one of our new clubs, has decided we need better school spirit. And so within that, we all did a big survey and created a list of the, the best spirits that we could do for the week. So um, Monday, oh, what was Monday? I forget what Monday was. Um, very tired. But yesterday was Cowboy Day. Oh, Monday was Taurus Day. Monday was Taurus Day. And people came in and like DC things, you know, there was a lot of um, Hawaiian shirts and all that. On Tuesday, it was Cowboy Day. And thus far, that is our biggest participated. There was um, lots of cowboy hats, flannels, the boots. It, it felt like cow cowboy country there. And today was Decades Day. Um, personally, I dressed up as a biker girl from the 50s. 
we had people from like the 20s all the way up to the 90s and it was it was a really good environment uh tomorrow is um color by grade so my grade is dressing in black and the staff is participating as well and they're going to be in pink so hopefully hopefully there's big participation within that um and then friday is anything but a backpack so that just entails you cannot have a backpack you can bring anything else to carry your stuff i'm thinking of doing my my big laundry hamper so um yeah i'm very excited for bring anything but a backpack i have a giant basket that i'm going to use um let's see next uh, the boys cross country team you might have heard this already but they won third place against over 150 teams i think at manhattan invitational eastern states race um i think it's the best they've done in that race you have to qualify for it and so we're all really proud of them for that um so this past week and throughout the last weekend going to this week it's the senior games for sports um girls soccer won against randolph two to one which is pretty impressive they've had a rough season but they're starting to bring it back up there was a football game on friday night if anyone and this is a football fan. Um, the boys are playing and they've been doing pretty good this season. Um, also the green and gold award, which if, for those of you who do and don't know, um, is awarded to a student in our school who is very prestigious in school and it um, is awarded so they'll be able to get a full blown scholarship to UVM. Um, this year it was Kale Humkey and he plays soccer and he he's, He's very prestigious in school. However, within that, um, he is not going to go to UVM. And there is some controversy and debate about if there should be a different system to choose this award so that'll actually be used um, productively and the person will actually go to UVM and it will work well. Uh, Unified Bowling is also starting up next week. Uh, Unified Bowling is part of the Special Olympics program and is dedicated to promoting social inclusion through shared sports training and competition ex experiences. Unified Sports joins people with and without disabilities on the team and is inspired by a simple principle. Training together and playing together is a quick path to friendship and understanding. It's my first year on the team. Uh, I wasn't able to do it last year because of COVID, but I'm very excited to see how it goes. And we might have a championship depending on COVID. I actually participated in Unified Bowling uh, a couple of years ago when I had surgery. And it was it was a really, really fun and um, positive experience to be able to work with people who are not able to play um, regular sports and just see them have so much fun, even with a little ramp, it's beautiful. Um, my final thing on our report is uh, the seniors this last week had an in-school field trip. Um, it was workshopped within essay writing, um, doing the FAFSA form, Common App, um, all of that just to help to help us apply for college for those who are applying. The early decision, early acceptance, um, early decision, early action is in the next month. So we're we're starting to get onto that deadline um, and starting to really work hard to actually get our applications in. Thank you. Thank you both. Maya, are you done too? Yeah, okay. Thank you both. Any questions from board members? Hey, Diane. I just wanted to thank you both for um, sharing the stories of, of action in the building and also of, of helping us keep in touch with those fun things, but also those things that are stressful, how exciting to have the early action and early decision, but also remembering how stressful it was for my kids. So um, thank you both for that, um, the dialogue and the fresh uh, information. Thank you both. Next, next year, you guys should make us wear the decades on the day of the board meeting. <laughs> I sort of am, but I don't have my biker jacket anymore. I do have, I have this red shirt and I had a red bandana. So it was, it was almost there. All right, good. Okay, let's move well, on. It's for, for, yes. for some of us, our clothes are, do cover the decades. They might be 30, uh, 40 years old. So, you know, we're wearing it too. So yeah, it's true. Yeah. I saw some impressive customs today, especially Jen Ingerson, who's not here. 
Okay, let's move uh, COVID uh, to superintendent report. COVID update, Jen? Yeah, before I do that, I wanna share some uh, super uh, late breaking news. And that is that Callie Weller, our pre-K teacher at Callis Elementary School has been named the 2021 Early Childhood Educator of the Year for the state of Vermont by the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children. The press conference and the award ceremony started tonight at six, right when our board meeting was happening. Um, the award's been going on for about five or six years now, I think. And Callie is the first public school pre-K teacher to win the award. So huge congrats to Callie, yeah. Um, let's see, COVID, uh, Maria and I are gonna uh, aim to give you the information you need and be succinct at the same time. So the first thing is surveillance testing. Again, I've been keeping you updated in the weekly community letter. This week, we had about 655 students participate in surveillance testing. So far, um, there have been no positive cases this week from surveillance testing. Knock on wood, we're waiting um, for some results from East Montpelier. We tested um, a day later to be in sync with a class that was quarantining and we're grateful to the lab for and everyone for allowing us to do that. So we're, we're still awaiting some results, but so far so good. Um, it is important to know that we don't yet, we've not yet received protocols for winter sports. We're still awaiting that guidance and, um, and that will be impacting uh, what happens around winter sports. We're also thinking that um, obviously the community transmission rate is still high. We do, when we get that uh, winter guidance uh, or sports guidance, want to look at our pro, uh, COVID protocols again and just make sure things are in alignment and are still feeling right as we get ready to uh, leave the warmer weather and enter the colder weather. So you can stay tuned for that. And um, I think the biggest thing is that we are preparing to implement the test to stay program and response testing. And Maria is the person who has the most up-to-date information about that. So I'm gonna invite her to share a little bit of an overview with you. So Maria. Hi everyone. Um, so we're really excited about the new offerings that the AOE is uh, giving us to keep kids in school. Um, they are giving us a test to stay program, which um, is specifically for children who have been exposed to COVID in school, which we know to be a low transmission area. And so, you know, just last week, we sent East Montpelier's first grade home for an entire week um, until they could test again with the guidance that we currently have. The test to stay program would have allowed us to keep those kids in class and use rapid antigen tests daily in the morning um, to assess whether or not they are contagious that day. So the way that would have looked is they would have come in in the morning to their own classroom. The nurse would have gone in and tested them. Um, the tests take 15 minutes to produce a result. If they're negative, the kids stay in school. If they have a positive rapid test, the parents pick them up. Um, and uh, we're excited because that will allow all unvaccinated students and staff to stay in school after a, um, an exposure in school. There's a few caveats to that testing. It has to be a school exposure because that's low transmission. If they're exposed at home, they have to quarantine. If they're exposed at hockey, they have to quarantine. Only if, say, our surveillance testing comes up with a positive and we know that those children were exposed in the classroom, which we know has multiple layers of mitigation, can they utilize this uh, option to stay in school. But we think that will make a really big difference in the long run in terms of keeping kids in school. The second part of that is response testing. Um, Right now, if kids come into the health offices and they are ill, we send them home. If they have multiple symptoms, we ask their parents to contact their PCPs and take a COVID test. Um, the response testing will allow us to give those kids um, a COVID test right in the health office of school. The, the parent will still have to pick them up. We're not letting ill children stay in school, but we can give them a COVID test if their parents wish right there in the office with about a 24 to 48 hour turnaround um, that our Binks tests uh, have currently. 
and that will at least give them some answers and save them the, of needing to find a testing site that's available to them on that day. So both of those things in um, conjunction with our valence testing should really help us be able to keep um, kids in school and be able to accurately and quickly assess their COVID stat. Yeah, so um, we were gonna offer to answer any questions. Lindy has a question. Lindy, go ahead. Um, the close contact in school what about close contact on a bus? Is that the same? It will count the same. The bus and the school will be considered the same um, amount of uh, transmission risk, yes. The other thing I, I neglected to mention, the important part of test to stay is that um, the children are still, well, anybody, the individuals, any unvaccinated individuals are still required to quarantine um, outside of school. So those kids are not allowed to play sports. They're not allowed to do after school activities. They shouldn't go grocery shopping or have play dates. They're still quarantined in the eyes of the state, but we're working on this specific strategy to keep them in school and in school alone, if that makes sense. Any other questions? Ursula has her hand up. Hi. You had mentioned, um, this was for in school, Lindy asked about bus, you mentioned soccer or hockey, if they're exposed during a school sport, like if they're doing soccer or if they're in the aftercare program, do those count? Yes, those will count um, because of all of the, the after school programs follows the same mitigation strategies that we do. Um, and sports are at, at this point, fall sports are still for the most part outside. So we know that they are low to moderate risk and they are covered in this program. Um, I have, again, until we get winter sports uh, guidance, I'm not 100% sure what that's going to look like with inside sports. Um, it will depend if they're masked or not masked. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and then another thing I think I didn't mention is the only thing we're waiting for is for the state to um, produce the consent form. They're just working on getting that finished um, and we are all set up to start as soon as they are ready. Thank you. I think Thank Maggie you, has her hand Maggie. up. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to thank administration and um, Maria in your capacity um, for embracing the test to stay. When those of us who participated in the regional board meeting, school board meeting a couple weeks ago, heard um, some distress from other districts about the burden of implementation, and um, I think in the with the goal of of equity. Um, this is just a, a great option. Um, so thank you for, for running with it. You're welcome, Maggie. What I, my answer to that is that a lot of that is due to the board. Um, you know, the, in 2020, we came to the board as nurses and we asked very earnestly to have full-time nurses for 2020, 2021. And you heard us and you implemented full-time nurses um, before all of the nurses in the entire planet were exhausted and burnt out and didn't want any more jobs. So we are very uniquely well set up to handle this added logistical pressure because we do have full-time nurses in every single one of our schools and we have a free floating COVID coordinator who can help out when there's added burden of time and work at all of our various schools. So thank you to the board and everybody who listened to what we really thought we were gonna need because it has really put us in a great, great position for this. I just wanna add as a really new board member, I was not aware about the full-time nursing um, until quite recently. And as, as a community member, I didn't get that information. And as a former district employee and a parent in the elementary school where that we didn't have the benefit of full-time nursing, I just think that's one of those things that we really need our community to hear is one of the, the things that the, the school board and the administration has worked to implement because um, it, it does deserve celebration outside of this meeting right now. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy, Maggie. did you yeah. have Lindy? 
Sorry, Flora, I'll let you do that. It's, a, it's okay, Lindy, go ahead. I'm just trying to move <laughs> just, us along. <laughs> sure. I kind of wanted to reiterate that because a lot of schools did away with the COVID coordinator because they thought the nurses could handle it in the schools and they wouldn't need that. And I can tell you that having that extra person when there's no substitutes or people to step in, um, I wasn't sure we needed it personally in my back of my mind. I was saying, why do we need one again next year? We're all going to be normal, aren't we? And um, I'm glad that we did do that. Any other questions from board members? Thank you, Maria, for, for all your work. Okay, Jen, you, um, let's move on into the Central Vermont Career Center. Hey, Jody is joining us as the new director of the Vermont Career Center. And we miss you, but we're glad that you're there. <laughs> so welcome, I Jody. I was really looking forward to this board meeting the most, just to see all these lovely faces again and names. So thanks for having me. We, we sent uh, some information in the package that hopefully you guys got to, to see. And I'm gonna let uh, Jody. she has a brief presentation that I'm hoping Jen, you're able to share. And uh, I will let her start with that. Is that what you would like to do, Jody? Let's start with the presentation and then we'll move on into questions. Let's do that. Okay. Thanks, Jen. So I um, am here on behalf of the Governance Committee of which Flora is the chair. So she'll have lots to, lots to do with this too and she can fill in whatever I leave out. Um, the Governance Committee started meeting in April of this year. And so I was not there at the beginning of that work but jumped in and, and have been able to see it through to the point that you're gonna see today. Uh, Jen, go ahead. I first want to say that all of the pictures for this presentation, I wanted to make sure that all of our programs were represented and they're all from this year. So you might see some faces you recognize. The Central Vermont Career Center provides um, an education for students from Cabot, Harwood, Montpelier, Spalding, Twinfield, and of course U32 with opportunities to experience real world technical work in a variety of programs. And so that includes auto and culinary and exploratory and emergency services and lots of others. Go ahead, Jen. The, the members of the committee are here. We have one member from each of the sending school boards. We have Judy from the state of Vermont, who's also on our advisory board for the, the center. Some community and business partners, a consultant, Mike Deweese, um, a couple of my staff. We also have Scott Farr. Looks like I need to edit this slide. Um, he is the director superintendent of the River Valley Career Technical Center in Springfield. And that is a, a model for the governance structure that we're looking towards. And Chris Hennessy, the new, um, the interim superintendent in Barry, has also been a member of this group. Go ahead, Jen. So a lot of the work that we did this summer was around the articles of agreement and bylaws for a potential new Central Vermont Career Center District. And some of you will remember that work as you form the Washington Central District and as school boards across the state merged together, they had to do that. We're doing the same work kind of in the opposite venue of separating from Barrie so that we can become a new district to support all of our communities and sending schools. Go ahead, Jen. So the new district would have 10 members total on its board. There would be four at large members who would be voted in. Um, and they would come from each of the four largest districts. So Washington Central would have an elected member as part of that. And there would be six appointed from their sending school districts as they are now for the regional advisory board. Um, votes for this new governance model and for the at-large board members would be commingled across our 18 towns if we were able to move forward with that. And that would take place in March. And one other piece of the highlights of our articles is that the current bargaining agreement, which honestly hasn't been agreed to yet, um, when it gets agreed to, we would keep that going in full force for our teachers. Go ahead. So um, the formation plan, actually we saw the first draft of that in our governance meeting last night. So it has been compiled. 
Uh, we will be giving feedback on that when we meet next Tuesday and finalizing that draft to send first to the Vermont Agency of Education for the first week of November is our deadline to send that. And they will hopefully respond and maybe have some edits and suggestions. And then we would take those on and move it forward to the State Board of Education, hopefully in December for approval. Go ahead, Jeff. If approved by the AOE and the State Board, our next step would be preparing our 18 sending school towns to vote on March 1st to support our new governance structure and to elect those four at-large members. And I have reached out to all 18 town clerks um, just to try to get them aware that this might happen and to be thinking about what commingling means because I didn't honestly know at first. And now I know that it means every town clerk would have to collect those ballots and bring them to Barry that night. So that's, it's an added burden on the, um, the folks working at the, at the town meetings. Go ahead, Jen. If approved by all of the voters in all of our 18 towns, or if approved by the majority actually, then our tra transition board, the elected and the appointed board members would begin preparing for the opening of the new district on July 1st of 2022. So next July. Go ahead, Jen. What are some implications for this, this change? I think one of the most important things is that our constituents, the people from all of the sending schools, would have some a greater say over what happens at the Central Vermont Career Center, and hopefully a little more understanding of what happens there. That all our towns would vote on the CBCC budget, not just Barry City and Barry Town, but everyone who has kids that attend, and all of them would be represented in our decision-making body. Right now, the Regional Advisory Board has representation from all the towns, but they are advisory only. They do not make the decisions. Go ahead, Jen. Um, some of you will remember that Penny Chamberlain, the former director, came to the board meeting, I think it was February, but sometime last spring, and talked about both this governance work beginning and the revisioning work that was going on. And you might have read some of the articles in the newspaper lately, the Times Argus, um, there's an article in the bridge today. Over 350 students applied to CVCC for this school year, and there are only 231 slots where we currently exist. We were able to accept over 200, which is the most that we've had in the 10 years, last 10 years. Our programs are necessary, not only for our students, but also for our local economy and businesses. As you know, everyone is seeking help. Schools are seeking help, everybody. There's help wanted everywhere. Go ahead, Jen. So we are con considering ways to expand within our current space while we also start to think about what might it look like if we're in a different space and a new governance structure could provide a means to getting to that new space and also would give every town and every sending school a voice in what that would look like or whether it would happen or not. So um, the revisioning next steps are, are looking at marketing firms. I think there is a, um, we have one tomorrow presenting to us as an option that we might choose to begin planning for marketing should we move forward in the future. And I think that will help us to market our governance change as well. Go ahead, Jen. So again, a change in governance would give our entire school community, all of our sending schools, all of our 18 towns, more of a say in what, what happens at Central Vermont Career Center moving forward. Go ahead. So um, I think this is a repeat and I just didn't take it out because I noticed it in one of my last ones. We hope to spread the word about this potential shift and that's why I've been visiting boards. Um, I've made it to Montpelier, Harwood and Twinfield, now Washington Central. Next week is Cabot and, and then Barry. Um, so it's exciting to go out and talk with folks at the boards from all the sending schools, especially the folks I know here. And I just wanted to come and share what we're doing so far and to see what questions you have. I think that's the next slide.
Thank you, Joey. Uh, maybe let's we'll stop the share. Oh, there. Thank you, Jen. So, do we have uh, questions from from the board members? Okay. Let's see, Scott Thompson. Thanks. Hey, Jody. Welcome back. <laughs> um, will this uh, free you from the from the uh, Barry City Schools roller budgetary roller coaster? We are actually already free from that. Ours is voted on separately from the Barry Schools, mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting. But the CBCC district um, or the CBCC budget is separated out and voted on separately. So the CBCC budget passed last year when the Barry School budget did not for a couple of times. Uh, interesting, and thank you. And and just one last thing, in the materials that were attached to this, um, there was one thing that kind of uh, hit me over the head with a two by four, which was a line about removal of board members. And it said that um, either a, uh, appointed or elected board members could be removed by a two thirds vote. Um, I hope that maybe someone can maybe delete the or elected. It just seems to me that elected board members should only be removable by, you know, um, either uh, by formal uh, censure or by the people who elected them. That's just, sorry, I, I just took advantage to pitch that. Thanks. I remember that discussion floor and maybe you can speak to that, but I think yeah. it might be two thirds of the voters on those. Yeah, no, so yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly, it's mostly the board uh, officials, uh, Scott, and just really just applies to the chair clerk. And uh, so it's removed from a position within the board. We can remove an elected board member. So it's, so if you had a, a chair that is acting in, in a way that is not reflective of the of what the majority of the board wants, it can be removed. And, and that was that you know it was unanimously agreed by all by all board members. That's what it was. We, we can remove. Uh, so you, that person would still be on the board. It would just have been removed from that that appointed position. Great, I, I misread it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. Hey, Kari. Hey, Judy. Um, so this is a, I have a question, but it, this is more of a comment for all of us, which is, uh, seems to me like the boat's not very far away and this is gonna be a bit of a communication challenge for the community. And so we should be thinking all together about what and how we communicate and I, so the, my question to you, Jody, is can you distill down uh, into the most succinct points what we need to communicate or what we ought to communicate together to our communities? And I think it's, you know, what's being proposed, what's, what's the benefit, what's the compelling reason, and then where can people go for more information if they, if they, if they need it? And, and we, I, I just think we need to start communicating this now so that we don't get to the vote and people are wondering like, what's this? And, and just, you know. I 100% you know. agree with you, Kari. That's uh, part of our next meeting also next week is the communication plan. Um, and part of the reason why I've been doing the outreach to the town clerks and trying to, and talking to Dave Delcor, who, who's probably on here and maybe he'll call me again tomorrow. Um, I think the most succinct points are that the Career Center serves students from 18 towns in central Vermont. And up until a governance shift, two towns in central Vermont have a say. They have done a great job, um, but the board, the board chair at Barry, Sonia Spaulding, has often expressed in board meetings that she feels uncomfortable making decisions on behalf of so many different sending schools and so many different communities that she does not represent. And I think that is the biggest reason for this change, that the people who are representing all of those communities should be the ones that have that voice and that decision-making power. And that's really important. And should there be changes in the future, your voices are really important in that. So if we are gonna grow, no matter whether that looks like expanding into multiple buildings, um, in central Vermont somewhere or building a new building somewhere so that we can meet the needs of students 
and industry, because quite frankly, we need some more adult programming as well. We need this shift to take place to free up the opportunities for that. Thank you, Jody. Any other questions from, from board members? So uh, at the next uh, at the next meeting on Tuesday, the 26th, we would be talking about the communications plan, Carrie. Right now we had got it just to what Jody had, had shared, you know, visiting the different boards. We don't uh, give the report back to the AOE until uh, until November 1st. So we want to get ahead, but we also don't want to get too ahead because it, this deadline is set by us. Is not set by um, right now. Is an aspiration <laughs> that 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 we have. We really want to be functioning on. You know, it, that board wants to be functioning in, in July in July first of twenty twenty two. But it's a it's a deadline that we put upon ourselves. So it would depend. We've been working hand by hand with Donna, but that it could change at at at, at any point. But we'll we'll keep everybody. Uh, Everybody informed with that, and it's just super, it's super exciting to to be able to be part of this of this process. And the one thing that we haven't mentioned is that we're, you know, once uh, we have a new, they have a new governance, they will be able to reach out to middle schoolers too, and start a little bit and start a little bit uh, sooner, and and really have a say on programs, right, and on um, educational outcomes for all. Uh, our students to do basically the work that we do now for our district, for all of the kids in that district. Uh, and the last thing would be that we have to, even though there's a re-envisioning part of this, a building part, those two things are separate and they're not, one is not contingent on the other. So that's a good thing to remember. We, we need the governance change most and for all first to be able to do what is best for all our kids in, in, and we have been, like Jody said, we have been lucky to be working with Barry for so many, for so many years. But all of the, all, all of Barry wants to share that responsibility. So let's move on, unless there is more questions. Yeah. Jen, you. you have the next. Thank you, Jody. Thank you for coming, and thank you for all your work. Thanks, Jody. Um, I will give you a quick update on the Humanity and Justice Coalition work. So we talked a little about this earlier in the meeting. I'm going to direct you back to page three in your board packet and just share a little bit more. So um, as you know, when we had uh, originally written the grant uh, and envisioned the scope of the work, we thought we'd have a, a coalition comprised of about 10 folks uh, with representation as articulated in the packet. And we extended the invitation for folks to apply and express interest, not knowing what we were gonna get. And we ended up with 20 people who um, were excited, which is thrilling. We are so excited about that. And as we sat down and thought about it, we were thinking, first of all, the, the grant um, period began July 1st. And the reality is we're about four months behind given uh, transitions and changes in leadership and COVID. So we're about four months behind our original timeline. And, um, and so what we've decided to do, because we've got these three top priorities related to culturally responsive and inclusive school community uh, practices and policies, um, looking at the curriculum and thinking about uh, strategies to diversify our educator workforce, we want to invite everybody who expressed interest to join us. It just didn't feel right to say no about when we're striving to increase uh, inclusivity and humanity and justice. So we've extended the invitation to all 20 people who have expressed interest. We're thrilled, we'll organize around these three priorities so that we'll have work groups of about seven or so people per priority so that we can still be manageable and productive in terms of our group size. So um, that so we we made that decision. We've um, sent out that invitation. It means we've got a little bit of tweaking to do in the grant itself. Martha Dice is the liaison who's administer, helping us administer the grant at the Agency of Education. We've notified her as well, but um, just 
super exciting that so many people have expressed interest and um, from really a lot of backgrounds, uh, most, not every single town represented yet, but this is a newly forming coalition. We hope that we're gonna lay the groundwork for a strong foundation for this work going forward. So that's the update on the coalition. Thank you very much, Jen. So I'm gonna give us five minute break, if that's okay with everybody and see you back at uh, 2015, okay? Welcome back, everybody. Seeing different cameras pop up. Okay, let's move into, into the finance, uh, into finance part. 5.1, uh, we have started to do this, uh, you know, for your information and action items in order to move you a, a little quick, quicker. Uh, could you, if, do you guys have any questions from the monthly reflection, the net mirroring or the quarterly fund balance? Otherwise I can give you some quick highlights if you hadn't had a chance to read them. And then we'll move uh, with Suzanne into the action items. Okay. Any questions from those, from those three? Okay. So let's move into, uh, into, in, into the action. I'm gonna just give you a quick highlight that the, in case you missed it, the net, cause I know that it's been a question everybody, the net metering decision doesn't need to happen until December 1st, okay? Uh, and then we, I publicly wanna thank Carla and Renee and, and Melissa for all the work done to get the contracts uh, out uh, this, this, this week. And Suzanne, <laughs> everybody. So let's move into the review and approve of the dental priv, uh, premiums and that's on page uh, 27. Scott, do you have a motion? Thank sure. you. Uh, of course. <laughs> I, I move that the board set the calendar year 2022 dental insurance premiums as follows, single plan, $552, two-person plan, $1,080, family plan, $1,512. Thank you, Scott. Could I have a second? Second it, Diane. Thank you, Diane. Any discussion? Suzanne is here if you guys have some questions. Or if you wanna, Suzanne, do you wanna give a brief description? I'm happy to if you want me to. Uh, members? Well, I don't see many questions, Suzanne. So I think we're okay. Let's move, let's move on. I'm not trying to steal your thunder, but I'm trying to no move No thunder stolen. <laughs> okay. Uh, so all of those in favor, uh, of approving the dental premiums for calendar year 2022. Please say aye with the motion aye. read by Scott. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Review and approve the HRA funding for year 23 budget. Chris? Scott, please. Uh, I'll, um, I'll move that the board authorize the use of the figures 1,500 and 3,000 for building the personnel projections for the health reimbursement accounts for the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget development. Thank you, Second. Scott. Thank you, Chris. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of approving the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And 5.23, uh, capital improvement project plan update. Could I have a motion to approve the schematic? Scott, go ahead. I don't want to monopolize this. I'm having all the fun well, here. Could, yeah, 
<laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm relying on the finance committee to start the, the motions and then you guys can ask questions. So go ahead, Scott. This is really helpful. Okay. Um, I move that the board authorize the superintendent to enter into an agreement with Black River Design not to exceed $15,000 to create schematic designs with estimates for the projects identified in the fiscal year 22-23 spreadsheet that was attached somewhere along the line, <laughs> but <laughs> but I think you've all we've all seen it, or, or those of us who have been around for a while have seen it. At page thirty-two. Page thirty-two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's Thank just you, that Chris. smaller list. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Can and I have a second? second? Thank you, Chris. Any questions? No discussion, seeing, seeing none. Thank you, Chris O'Brien, for all the work on, on this. And uh, let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? The motion carries unanimously. Let's move into policy committee and I'll pass this on to you, Chris. Thanks, Floor. <clears throat> so hello to everyone. And we have three policies up for adoption tonight. Um, we, these were policies that came back to the uh, committee um, and uh, with Mark Klein's guidance, we did some editing and shaping of the policy. And um, I think, produced a better policy. One of the more significant changes was uh, eliminating some um, uh, policy language that had staff members concerned, particularly over confiscation of, of personal electronic devices. Um, so with that, um, we first up is uh, B8, uh, the electronic communication between employees and students policy. Um, and this is up for adoption now. Chris, and I, I just want to clarify I, they're warned for a first reading and adoption on November 17th. Well, we didn't adopt them then. We no, did not up. adopt them previously. There was, we, there, I think we tabled them to reconsider them at the policy yeah, committee. First, yeah, so first this is a first today, reading. Chris, and then we're going to adopt them oh, to at be our adopted. meeting okay. in sorry. November. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you very much. Sorry okay, about that's that. That's what she was trying to okay, say. So, okay, so... Thank you, Jen. Uh, so for first reading, B8, which is the electronic communication between employees and students policy. Are there any questions from board members on uh, this policy as presently constituted? I can't see, Maria, I can't see. Diane. Diane. So um, I know that there was the strong concerns and you you referenced it, Chris, but yeah. so was that, so there was staff involvement in reviewing what those concerns were? Yes, um, it wasn't more, it was not as much in this past meeting, but meeting before we had staff members uh, come and express strong concerns about some of the language. Any other questions? I don't see any other hands up. Okay. Um, so uh, next up is policy D3, which is responsible computer, internet, and network use. Any questions from board members or anyone else in this meeting about the uh, policy language? I don't see any hands up. I, I guess okay. I, I I would like to just uh, just to have it on the record. If you could just describe a little bit the conversation, since there was a little bit of a controversy before, just how the conversations had been and who was included in that conversation. So all the um, policy committee members were included. I think in our last meeting we did we had uh, Ellen uh, Noble from East Montpelier participated as well. Uh, and part of one of the concerns was this question as to whether we actually needed these policies at all, dealing with um, you know, our, our internet, our network, and the electronics 
And um, Mark said we did, uh, and he was uh, satisfied with with these particular policies. Um, he went through them with a fine tooth comb, uh, made proposed language changes for us to consider, and felt that they provided the security that we needed for our networks and the governance of electronics in our in, with our system. I, I'd Thank like you. to add as well on the committee when we met, this one is required and it is a VSBA um, one. The one before is also VSBA vetted. Uh, I think some of the concerns before were there were several policies that had come differently, but this one is a required VSBA policy and people have looked at it and made their suggestions. Thank you, Lindy. Diane has her hand up. Diane? Yeah, I guess um, in the, so did we have these policies before? Because when we've seen policies where there's some edits, as you were saying, Chris, that Mark um, helped clarify things, we've seen those edits. And so I'm not, you know, we've seen like the strike throughs and everything prior to the final adoption. So I just wonder um, if that exists somewhere. You know, I, I'm sure it does. And if you like, we can have them uh, produced along with the policies for our next meeting. So you can actually see where the edits were and what was taken out. That would be helpful. Or, or change, or just change. Yeah. Yep, Great. thank you. Okay, fine. If it wouldn't be you know, um, yeah. on this D3, this had been adopted previously. The reason it's back to you is because we moved a paragraph or two uh, at the very end about uh, law enforcement involvement. As I, this is how I remember it. So Chris, please correct me if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> at the bottom we added, <clears throat> excuse me, we added a paragraph that says law enforcement requests regarding district devices. Right. What we ended up doing there was modifying it so that it was clear that it was the superintendent uh, who addressed any and all requests like that. Earlier, the, the policy was a little bit broader, um, and we narrowed it so that uh, if there was any request for um, access to either equipment, software, or an account, uh, that it went through the superintendent's office. Michelle? And in that first policy um, about the communication between um, employees and students, the only thing we changed from what the VSBA had was we added um, the prevention of um, sexual harassment Title IX to the policy section on the, on the last page in two places. That was the only thing we changed from what the VSBA had proposed. Thank you for that clarification, Michelle. And, and we did not have the policies before? Okay, thank you. Chris? Um, so next up we have uh, policy B uh, E46, dealing with memorials. Um, and this has um, been revised so that um, we are um, dealing with um, memorials that are more controlled through the schools. Um, actually, more of a unified policy amongst all the schools that there'd be a common uh, memorial uh, that each school uh, would be placed at each school for remembering students, staff members, uh, and that they would be maintained by the district as a whole. Uh, we've, that was a revision that we made because it was not clear that um, it would be the district as opposed to the individual schools. Uh, it also, and, and actually Jody Emerson was very helpful in previous policy committee meetings uh, for informing us about how um, emotional um, dealing with memorials or removing memorials that had already been in place was. So uh, we uh, burned into, into this policy about notifying family members uh, when that was going to happen so uh, that they would be aware and it wouldn't just be done without their knowledge. Um, so it's really kind of a, a policy that I think will revamp how we deal with memorials and 
uh, where they are and how long how long the uh, ones that are already in place will be grandfathered. Any questions? Didn't we already do this though? I know that you're saying it's been changed slightly, but I would think that I thought we had already approved this like a year or so ago. So then therefore that that um, 12 month period would already be done. You know, I'm, that's not my recall, Diane. It, you may be right, but it was back before us. So we, I don't think we ever got to the revisions, um, but it was a constant future item. Yeah, we hadn't done it, Diane. It was discussed, but not adopted. Discussed. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you to the policy committee for all that work. Uh, let's move into our consent agenda. And we have minutes for September 22nd for a board meeting and minutes for our community forum. Uh, could I have a motion uh, for each of them if, to move them as a slate? I think it's okay uh, if you guys are comfortable with that. So moved. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Maggie. Any discussion? There's a lot of minutes to read, guys. Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes for September 22nd and October 6th, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Approved board orders. Lindy. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Uh, I make a motion to accept the board orders ending on October 20th in the amount of $803,452.23. Have a second. 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 Oops, sorry. Diane? Yeah, Diane. Okay, any discussion, any questions? All those in favor of approving the board orders uh, as read by Lindy, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Lindy? That was the only one. Oh, that was the only one. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. Phew, that was the only one I had open. And we don't, don't forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we don't have, I was, emails, I was so. thinking, yeah. Uh, so moving into approved new teachers and resignations, uh, we don't have any that I know. <laughs> I don't have any right now. No. Okay. Hopefully next time. But Floor, can I ask yes. a question? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, because the based on comments earlier and also the realization, I'm realizing as a board member that I'm not sure where we stand with any positions that maybe we're not able to be filled or what the procedure is to make sure that we're covering the needs of any of those positions. Um, and so I thought this was a good spot to ask that question as to. Um, are we able to get updates about unfilled positions, the impact and possible plans? Yeah, let's go ahead and have that. Jen has been adding a little bit to her newsletter, but this would be a good spot to Jen. Yeah. So we still have a number of key vacancies. Um, I, I don't have a list in front of me, so I'm gonna go by memory, okay? Um, we have a driver's ed position that's still open. We have a memorandum of understanding about that. We're continuing to advertise and we have a, a workaround for the time being, um, although really wanting to have uh, somebody in that position. Um, we still have a literacy interventionist position open at Callis. We have um, some flexibility right now with somebody in, in staff doing some literacy intervention. We're in the works with um, being able to partially fill that position. I, I wasn't ready to bring to you tonight, but that we're making progress on that. Um, music in Berlin and Callis rem remain a struggle as you heard during public comment tonight. Um, we have a substitute at Berlin who is not licensed, is doing a lovely job, but is not a certified 
music teacher and that that's sustainable only for so long and we are patching together something in the short term at Callis. We doubled up um, with some technology integration to meet some contractual needs. We're now doing some additional um, dance right now and, um, and that does impact health education at Romney and Berlin. We're trying to flex and, and work around that. We have some key, I think that's it for the teaching positions. We have some key um, behavior interventionist openings still in the district. We have some um, openings in custodial services and in food services. And these positions are causing a, a strain on our system, as you can imagine. We were just in a conversation earlier today about how to start to get creative and think outside of the box so that we can meet our contractual obligations around uh, lunch breaks, for example, when we're short staffed with um, in some departments. So we're working on it. Our principals are working hard. We have things advertised. We refresh in school spring um, and we are not alone. Uh, on a somewhat related note, although we don't employ our bus drivers, we have had impacts with shortages of bus drivers. We're not immune to that either. We've done some really uh, creative and last minute rerouting of buses. Uh, Michelle Sepka and Sue Bershow worked hard to pull that off at the last minute, and it has impacted athletics at times too when we haven't had bus runs. Um, Folks are stepping up and subbing as they are able to do so. And that also goes back to sort of the gratitude and the sort of coming together, all hands on deck and people are tired. So it is, um, it's, it is a strain on the system. That's, that's where we stand right now. Maggie? Maggie? I was just curious if the music teacher <clears throat> um, search had extended to current um, edu music education students and if there's, you know, had any a conversation about creatively trying to fill that position with someone who would be functioning under like a para <clears throat> title, but specializing in music since they wouldn't have licensure or provisional licensure. Yeah, we've reached out to um, to local university programs. We've um, worked, shaken the bushes. We're working hard. Um, any, we welcome create <laughs> creative ideas and contacts. We'll we'll reach out. Let us know. Thank you, Jen. I think that's another example of something. You know, these things. These are things the community needs to hear directly. You know, considering we had a. a Berlin elementary educator um, talking about this and the public comments early in the meeting, you know, you guys are working so hard to address these things, but I'm not confident that this information is getting out to people um, on a routine basis. And, and, you know, if that falls on us, that we need to find a way as a board to ensure that that communication is had. Um, it just feels very important because I think it would lend itself towards greater community appreciation for the incredibly difficult work that you do at the at the school levels and at the central office. Thanks, Maggie. Lindy? I was going to comment on seeing it in the front porch forum, I think is good. I've noticed you putting it in there and I'm not sure people who aren't in education understand how widespread it is. And um, I know uh, in the district where I'm working, we just hired somebody in the TAP program to do music. And that one, she should be doing it as a student intern, but we're going to get um, her as a music teacher. And it's, it's just so interesting how, what a shortage there is across the board and spreading the word any way you can. And I have seen it in Front Porch Forum and I said something to somebody the other day about, wow, they're even putting it in Front Porch Forum just to let people know it's no longer that we expect people are going to school spring and looking. But do you have any friends? Do you know anybody who just retired? Do you, 
it's um, it's an interesting but not very fun conundrum. Our principals have also put it in their newsletters as well, and we've gotten a few folks from that. So parents who have said, hey, maybe, and, and we have gotten a few um, bites, which has been great. We're, we're doing what we can. Thank you, Jen. And I just want to comment that it's a trend in the entire state and in the entire New England, and I believe the country is really hard right now. And the, both the governor and the Secretary French are trying to come up with some creative ideas too, and how to support some districts that are having to close at points when they don't have enough staff or enough buses, bus drivers. Uh, let's move into a board reflection. Any thoughts? Scott, it, well, I'm gonna let Diane go first. No, just kidding. No, Scott, go ahead. <laughs> Should I brace or like, no, just no, go ahead. Um, go ahead. <laughs> um, th this kind of also spills over into um, public comments. Uh, I think you may have seen that Chris Winters sent an email to all of us right before the board meeting. And um, in terms of the, the question of public engagement and uh, the relation between ourselves as a board and our constituents, um, his last paragraph is very interesting that um, you know it's very difficult without a local board and without being allowed in the schools to understand what may be happening we are all at an uncomfortable level of disconnect. Um, I think that's well put. Um, and uh, this is you know, partly due to COVID, um, partly due to the, uh, the nature of, of being a single district with um, you know, all of us, each of us representing all 10,000 people who live in it. Um, and trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and I applaud the efforts made so far and look forward to um, you know, the discussions to come. Thank you, Scott. Diane? I really appreciated having the very clear and concise reflections as well as um, inf background information needed to make some of these decisions. So I found that extremely helpful. Thank you, Diane. Lindy? Lindy, are you? Yeah, I couldn't yeah. get it to unmute. I don't know okay. what was going on. Um, I didn't get the email from Chris Winters and I just checked email again because I usually check it right before. I don't know why I've checked both of my email addresses. I, I am on a local board. Our board is the local board. And I I have trouble when I hear that. It kind of makes the hair on my neck stand up because uh, I represent all the schools and I live locally and I feel this is a local board and I would hope anyone in any of the towns who feel they want my ear as a board member would contact me um, no matter what town they live in or I live in because I represent all of these schools who feed into U32 and then into the world. So I, I'm hoping somebody will forward that email to me because I didn't see it or I didn't get it. Thank I'll you, I'll send Scott. that over, Lindy, yeah, or, or Scott right now. Yeah. I just did it. Oh, great, thank you. Any, any other board reflections? Kari, go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering if we want to do a, um, a summary for Front Porch Forum like we have been doing the past few months. And carry on with that practice? Yes, please. Yes. I assume you're volunteering. Thank you. Yeah, yeah well, I'm, I'm tempted to volunteer to work with Maggie on it, if Maggie's willing. Great. Great. I'm game. Yeah, I'd love to. OK, and then, and then we'll run it by the steering committee just so other people see it before we distribute it. OK, great. Thank you, Thanks. Kai. Any other board reflections from our meeting? Okay. A public comments. 
let me see if I see any hands open. I don't know if we have any members of the public left. I don't see anybody. Well, seeing none, I, I just want to thank everybody to, for being patient as we had a technology challenge this this afternoon, and 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 thank you for staying with it. I know it was a long meeting, but uh, we got it all done. And thank you to all the staff for being here. Uh, Chris, I see you just popped up. Thank you for all your work, everybody. See you. Good luck the rest of the week. It's just Wednesday. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.